This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Hello, I'm Gary Massey. The reason I'm talking to you today is because in addition to being a Bible teacher, I'm also a practicing attorney. I've represented thousands of clients, trying dozens of cases before judges and juries. In modern day courtrooms, cases are tried before a governmental representative, a judge who has the authority to make decisions about what happens to people. God often uses the symbol of a trial, much like the trials that we have today, to explain what's going to happen to everyone at the final judgment. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, he said, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Again, in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, the Bible says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Echoed again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The good news is that much like earthly trials, we are allowed to have an advocate, a representative. In most cultures, in most societies today, when a person is brought to trial in front of a governmental representative, then they're allowed to bring a lawyer or a defender, an advocate, to plead their case. The Bible tells us that our divine trial allows us the same privilege. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word translated advocate there comes from the Greek word parakletos. It's often translated as one who appears on another's behalf, a mediator, an intercessor, a helper. It comes from two different Greek pieces. The first one is a prefix, para, which means beside, around, or from the side of. The second piece is from the word kaleo, very similar to the English word call. And that's what it means, to call, to make a strong request, to implore, to entreat, to urge. It has the idea of bringing cheer or comfort or encouragement. And so what 1 John is telling us is that Jesus is the one who calls from beside us, our parakletos, our intercessor, the one who pleads earnestly on our behalf. The same idea is mentioned in other scriptures as well. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Hebrews 7, verse 25 says, He always lives to make intercession for them. Today we're going to talk about Jesus as our advocate. And as we study what the Bible says, we'll see that we could not have a better defender, a better advocate. In selecting a lawyer, you want a lawyer who understands the judge before whom you're going to appear. Judges can vary significantly in their character, their tendencies, their preferences. Some judges may want things very technical and very specific. Other judges may want a lawyer to present a case that focuses only on the most important issues and doesn't get sidetracked in what he would think of as things that are too technical. Jesus is the perfect advocate, the perfect defender, because he understands intimately the character of our judge. 1 John 2 verse 1 says that we have an advocate with the Father. God the Father is the judge. He will be the judge who decides our eternal future. And one of the things that we all need to understand about our judge 
is that he is the God of perfect righteousness, the God of perfect justice. In the New Testament, sometimes we read the word righteous and sometimes we read the word justice, but in the original language, it's the same word. And English translators will sometimes translate it righteousness, sometimes translate it justice. But God the Father is perfect in righteousness, which is to say he's perfect in justice. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4 says, For all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. You know what indignation is, a feeling of anger, a feeling of wrath against sin. When somebody takes your property, when somebody commits violence against you, when somebody commits some sort of injury against your family member, you feel indignation. You feel wrath, and you have a desire for punishment. Well, God the Father, the God of perfect justice, feels indignation every day. He hates every sin. He hates every form of evil. That's why David prayed in his psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, verse 4, to God the Father, he says, against you. You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. The sad truth is every sin is an offense against God. So not only is God the Father the righteous judge, He's also the victim of our sin. He's also the victim of of our crimes. And we also know that justice requires punishment. And God, therefore, being the God of perfect justice, requires every sin to be punished. Proverbs 11, verse 21 says, Assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And so we have a divine trial in front of a divine God of absolute and perfect justice. And his sense of justice which is also imprinted upon our own character, requires that no sin committed will ever go unpunished. Even those who died will not escape the punishment of God. But our advocate, our perfect defender, he shares that sense of perfect justice. Jesus himself shares that character with God the Father. We started out in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word righteous could also be translated just. Jesus Christ, part of the divine Godhead of justice. Because you see, Jesus is God, a member of the Godhead. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among men. Jesus is that Word. He is God who became flesh and dwelled among us. And so we have a judge who is the God of perfect justice, but our advocate understands that. He understands the indignation and the wrath and the anger that God feels toward all sin. In earthly trials, cases begin when someone brings a case or a claim against the defendant. 
In criminal cases, it may be the police filing charges against a person. It may be a prosecutor. Sometimes they're called a district attorney or an attorney general, or maybe even be the Justice Department, depending on who it might be. In a civil trial, it's usually the person who has been harmed or the survivors of a person who has been killed, usually called a plaintiff. But prosecutors or lawyers who represent victims almost always use similar arguments and analogies from trial to trial. And so when selecting an attorney, it's very helpful to have an attorney who understands the opposing lawyer's approach, how he does things, and especially the things that he does over and over again. In the divine trial that you and I will both face at the end of time, there is a prosecutor there as well, but it's Satan. In Job chapter 1 and 2, we're introduced to Satan, and Satan there means adversary or accuser. And you remember what he said to God when God said, have you considered my servant Job? Satan says, well, Job is upright and righteous, but if you take away his possessions, he will curse you to your face. And so Satan accused Job of what Job would do in a hypothetical situation. So God allowed Satan to take away Job's possession and even his family. But Job still didn't sin in what he said. And so in chapter 2, God brings it up to Satan again. And Satan says, yes, but if we take away his health, if you allow me to touch his body, he will curse you to your face. And so there we see again Satan accusing Job based on what Job will do according to Satan. We see other instances in the Bible of Satan making accusations against God's people. In Zechariah chapter 3, God is giving Zechariah a preview, a prophecy about resurrecting temple worship in Jerusalem. And in this dream, in this vision, it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, has a similar idea. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And of course, that refers to Satan. Much like he did with Job, Satan accuses God's people, like Jonathan the high priest and Christians today, constantly and incessantly to God the Father. Always trying to get God the Father to focus on our sins, to focus on our shortcomings. But your situation and my situation is quite different than the situation of Job. Earthly trials always involve evidence. The longer the trial, the more important the case, usually means the greater the amount of evidence. Oftentimes it's brought in in banker's boxes with reams and reams of paperwork, all of which has been poured through and all of which will be presented to the judge or to the jury. Our trial, our divine trial, will be different than Job because Satan doesn't have to guess what we would do to accuse us. There's already a record of what we've already done. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 and 13 says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Every deed you have ever done has been recorded by God. And Revelation 20 right there tells us that when we face our divine trial, books will be opened. 
and will be judged according to the things written in the books, according to our deeds. Clearly teaching us that our deeds are written in those books. So when Satan accused Job, he didn't point to Job's deeds. He pointed to hypothetical deeds with me and with you. He won't need hypothetical deeds. He'll have books of deeds. And it's not just the way we've interacted with other people. It's not just the things that we have done with other people. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. So not just your actions, but your careless hurtful words, your criticisms, your gossip, your condemnation unfairly has been recorded and will be called to account at your divine trial. It's not just your deeds and not just your words. It gets even worse. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 says, wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Even our unspoken motives, our selfishness, our jealousy, our desire to see somebody fall off their perch, all of these things will be revealed at our divine trial. But what's even worse is that our prosecutor does not have the best interests of society at large. In earthly trials, we expect our prosecutors to represent the interests of the state, to represent the interests of the community or the county, of the collective interest of all the citizens. But at our divine trial, our prosecutor is going to represent his own interest. But thankfully, Jesus understands that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Sin is a product of the devil. The reason sin exists is because of the temptation that the devil introduced into the world. And the reason that Jesus came in human form was to undo what Satan had done. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, through death, talking about Jesus, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Our prosecutor is not honest and straightforward. His desire is not to protect society, it's to cause your death. It's to separate you eternally from your creator, the God who loves you and the God who wants a relationship with you but who is also the God of perfect justice. Thankfully, our advocate understands that crooked prosecutor. In order to represent a client effectively, a lawyer must understand his client. He must understand his client's experience to be able to tell his client's story. I know a lawyer who recently had a client a young girl, a pre-teenager, who went in for a medical procedure and because of a mistake by the medical providers was rendered blind, completely unable to see. After a few years, the girl is a young teenager and the lawyer is trying to prepare the case for trial, but he's struggling to find the right way to tell the young girl's story. He went to the client's house and waited for the young girl to get home. She got off the school bus and she came inside. She dropped her books on the table. She got something to drink and went back outside and went and sat in a car sitting in the driveway. After a few minutes, the lawyer asked the girl's father, where did the girl go? He said, look out the window. And The lawyer went to the window and peers beyond the curtains. And the young girl is sitting in the car, moving the steering wheel, looking into the back seat. The lawyer asks the girl's father, what is she doing? And the dad said, she's driving the car, she'll never drive, talking to the friends she used to have. And then the lawyer knew 
how to tell her story. Jesus knows how to tell your story. He understands your experience perfectly. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Did you know that Jesus understands temptation even better than you do, even better than I do? Jesus has withstood every temptation. None of us know the maximum amount of temptation. None of us have ever reached the maximum amount of temptation without giving in. But Jesus has, and He understands what that means. And He understands what it's like to feel hurt or embarrassment or rejection. And He also understands your guilt. He knows, much like the prosecutor, that you're guilty. He knows what's in that mountain of evidence, in those books that will be opened. But if you go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. He's writing this when we do sin, to bring us comfort. If you back up just three verses to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. He says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. As an advocate, Jesus only takes guilty clients. His first requirement is that we admit that we have sinned, that we admit our need for a defender, our need for someone to protect us from the justice that should be coming our way. But if you notice there in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says that He is righteous to forgive us our sins. If sin requires punishment, how can it be righteous of Jesus to forgive us of our sins? Righteous, just. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 answers this question. It says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness or His justice because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus' forgiveness of our sins God's forgiveness of our sins through the redemption of the blood of Christ is righteous and just because it involves redemption. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Our perfect advocate who understands his client has the perfect defense. So God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world according to our deeds. We all have a trial date set for our trial before the righteous judge. We have a crooked prosecutor with a mountain of evidence of our own sins, but we have an advocate who understands us. But how can even he have the perfect defense? Well, his defense is not that ours is a case of mistaken identity. It's not that we've been confused with somebody else. It's not that we have an alibi. It's not that we were somewhere else when the sin was committed. And it's certainly not that our acts were all righteous, that what's being called a sin is not actually a sin. On the other hand, his defense is that our punishment was already administered. 1 John chapter 2, 
verse 2 says, He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The idea of propitiate is to atone, to satisfy, to assuage. And that's what Jesus has done. He has offered Himself as a substitute for us. Someone who has taken our punishment, not that punishment is not deserved, not that justice does not require punishment to be carried out, but simply that the punishment has already been carried out. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The idea is this, that every one of our sins was turned into a judgment of guilt. And then all of the judgments of guilt of which we're guilty were then consolidated into one decree, one court order for our punishment. But Jesus took that decree that gathered all of our sins and all of the court orders against us, and He nailed it to the cross. He put it on the cross and paid for it there. John chapter 19 records the crucifixion, records the death of Jesus. And it records His final words in verse 30. It reads, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. The word translated, it is finished, is the word tetelestai. And this is a word from the world of accounting that means that a debt has been paid in full. And so it's the same thing that they would stamp on a tax bill in the Roman Empire. When you went and paid your taxes, they would stamp on your bill tetelestai, paid in full. Those were Jesus' last words as He died on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. So the idea is not that you are innocent. It's not that you did not sin. It's not that you did not deserve punishment. It's simply that your punishment was transferred to Jesus. And that's redemption. Jesus purchased you out of bondage to sin, out of slavery to sin, out of punishment. Took your punishment to set you free. If you park at a parking meter and you put your money in the parking meter and then you leave your vehicle and then you stay gone for too long and the parking meter time expires and then a representative of the government comes along and they give you a ticket and you get the ticket. And then about a month later you get summoned to court and they said, well, the fine originally was $11, but now that you didn't pay the fine, the fine has become $50. Well, if you pull out a receipt showing that you paid the $11, then that's a defense to having to pay the $50. You're not saying that you didn't violate the law. You're not saying that the time didn't expire and you became parked illegally. You're saying you paid the fine already. And that's what Jesus did for us. He paid the punishment already. He took our sin, became our sin, represented us on the cross so that our punishment would be carried out in Him. And so 1 John 2 verse 1 says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteousness. Verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins. But don't forget about verse 3. Verse 3 says, By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Jesus offers to defend you, to pay your debt 
with his own blood. But in return, he demands that you commit the rest of your life to him, that you walk in his steps, that you live according to his word.